Thank you, Chris. Yes, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, today going to build on what we talked about yesterday uh, and uh, try to see how we can apply now this knowledge that we have uh, about the signature of the ice in the ocean and the influence of the atmosphere on actually retrieving some quantitative ice information. Uh, again, uh, let me acknowledge uh, all my collaborators in, uh, in doing this work. Um, and, uh, and then uh, get right into just a couple of slides to summarize uh, this, uh, what we talked about yesterday. Um, this, uh, oh, I'm supposed to use the pointer here, I, I guess. Here you go. So, um, so we looked at uh, the uh, microarray radiometer measurements from the AMSER-2 uh, radiometer on JAXA's TCOMW satellite. Uh, and, uh, and we saw that uh, over the frequency range from 6.9 gigahertz to 90 gigahertz, uh, there's a lot of different components, uh, physical properties of the ocean and the atmosphere that influences the microarray radiation. Uh, and those being, oops, sorry, those being uh, the sea surface temperature in, in red here that has the m uh, majority of its impact at uh, very low frequencies. Uh, then there was the water vapor absorption, which was strongest uh, around the water vapor absorption line here, 22 gigahertz, but actually also continues out into the high frequencies. Uh, and you can see that there is actually not only at the absorption line, but also uh, at higher frequencies in particular, uh, an impact of uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. Then there was the impact of uh, sea surface wind speed, which is generally has an impact over the entire frequency range that we are looking at. Uh, and finally, the influence of clouds, uh, which is the, uh, the yellow line uh, here, uh, or, or as we normally uh, refer to this in, in, in microarray radiometry, the integrated cloud liquid water, so the amount of liquid water in the, in the column of the atmosphere that we are looking through uh, to see the surface. This impact increases, like the water vapor uh, impact, towards the higher frequencies. And then we looked at sea ice, and uh, this is sort of the summary of, uh, of the sea ice figure, uh, where we saw that uh, first year ice that contained salt uh, was like a black body in the microwave range. Uh, it had a very high emissivity, and hence the brightness temperature was very close to the physical temperature. Uh, and, uh, and then when the ice when it uh, survived a summer season, this salt drained out due to the melt processes, uh, and, uh, and we were left with some ice that actually had, instead of the, the salt trapped inside the ice, we had voids of air uh, inside the ice pack, and these uh, air bubbles, as we call them, they scatter the microarray radiation at the shorter wavelength, uh, so at the higher frequencies, uh, and this scattering uh, leads to a, a decrease uh, as we see here, in the uh, emissivity or brightness temperature of multi-air ice. Uh, and then finally, uh, for uh, water, uh, the main characteristic for, for, for the water surface um, is uh, the large difference in horizontal and vertical polarization compared to ice, where you see that both for first-year ice and multi-year ice, there's two sets, well, for uh, all three substances, first-year ice, multi-year ice, and water, there are three set, uh, two curves, one for horizontal and one for vertical polarization. But in particular, for first-year ice, those two are pretty close together. For multi-year ice, they're a bit further apart. But for a water surface, uh, they are much further apart. So, so these are sort of the main uh, 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 properties of the microarray radiation that we will expect uh, from water surfaces and from, uh, from ice of, uh, of the two different kinds here. Uh, we also saw uh, how in the summer, wet snow on the surface of the ice uh, transitioned multi-year ice into a signature which is very close to the first-year ice signature. And we saw how melt water on the surface of the ice uh, would decrease uh, and, and uh, the uh, brightness temperature of the ice and make it look like open water. So how can we take advantage of this uh, and uh, actually build algorithms that uh, can translate measurements of brightness temperature into sea ice concentration. How can we calculate sea ice concentration from these brightness temperature measurements? And already here, I think it's important to stress that, uh, I, I, as has already been mentioned this morning and also uh, by Sultan yesterday, uh, that um, 
actually most satellite measurements are not measurements of the physical quantities that you want to measure. Satellite measurements are measurements of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and in order to translate this, these measurements of electromagnetic radiation, multispectral measurements often, um, we need algorithms and we need typically to make some assumptions. Uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, like or dislike these assumptions, uh, but, uh, but they are uh, sort of inherent in the process of translating the actual microwave measurements into physical variables. So now we're first going to talk about very simple uh, algorithms to derive ice concentration. And these are the ones that have the most strongest assumptions, uh, the most severe assumptions. Um, so the assumptions are the three, the main assumptions are the three that I mentioned at the top. Uh, first of all, that there's no atmospheric variability. So we saw that water vapor influences the measurements. We saw that clouds influence the measurements. But here we make the assumption that this is all the same all the time and we don't need to worry about it. Secondly, that there's no ocean signature variability. We also saw that wind has a strong impact on the brightness temperatures. So this is obviously also not necessarily a good assumption. Um, and then finally, uh, we also assume that there's no ice or snow variability, that we can use fixed, what is called type points, so fixed signatures of the two ice types, first year ice and multi ice, and that's all we need to know about uh, the, the ice uh, in the areas uh, that we want to observe. And typically we do this, uh, and, 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 and many of these simple algorithms that have been around for many years, uh, they, they work this way, and uh, they actually work all year round, or they are applied all year round. Maybe work is not the right word. Um, and obviously, then, you can see the drawback of doing it in this simple way. If these assumptions don't hold, then we get errors in the ice concentration. We get biases, or we get larger uh, variations, larger noise, uh, larger uncertainties in the ice concentrations. And maybe even worse, if there are trends in atmosphere or snow parameters, they might be misinterpreted as trends in ice concentration. And, uh, and then uh, at, at, an additional statement here is that uh, work both done in the US and, uh, and in Europe uh, has, uh, has strong indications when validating these sea ice products uh, that ice concentration variability above 95% is not real, but it's due to variability in snow uh, that is not accounted for. So the, the variability of the wetness of the snow and the grain size of the snow uh, actually influences the microwave radiation to an extent uh, that causes an uncertainty with these simple algorithms in the order of, of, of easily 5% uh, variation in, uh, in ice concentration. But we'll return to this in a minute. We'll, we'll just have a look at, 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 at an ex one, one example of how such a simple algorithm might work. Uh, and here we're going to, uh, to use an, uh, an algorithm. So this is, again, the same figure as you saw before. But now we're going to take uh, the, a look at an algorithm that uses only these two frequencies. Uh, this is 18 gigahertz, or 18 or 19 gigahertz. And this is 37 gigahertz. And, uh, and we're actually only going to use vertical polarization. So they are the top curves. So this one for water, this one for uh, multi-year ice, and this one for first-year ice. Uh, and now we are going to take a lot of data points, uh, either from open water or from ice. We don't know what type of ice, uh, and actually it seems that most of them are mixtures. Uh, and then we're going to try to figure out what signature to use, what type point to use for water, what type point to use for first year ice, and what type point to use for multi ice. So the type points are being the signatures, these fixed signatures. And, um, and if we do that, I mean, it's not so difficult to find areas where there's no ice. You can uh, uh, go away from the ice edge uh, into the ocean, and, uh, and you can find uh, open water data. It's more tricky to actually find data points that you know are from areas of 100% ice. But we have uh, various methods to do that as well. Uh, we look at uh, data points uh, from areas where, from the ice drift pattern, you can see that, uh, that there's convergence uh, in an area, and convergence from a situation already of very high ice concentration means that uh, there's probably no openings uh, in the ice pack, uh, uh, new, new openings formed in the ice pack, uh, and whatever, whichever openings might have been there uh, the day before will close due to the convergence or will refreeze if we're in the winter situation. Uh, so this is, a, this is a, a winter figure. So that way we can kind of establish this line, which is the line that connects a multi-year ice signature and a first-year ice signature. So the first-year ice signature being the, uh, the, 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 the black body. So this is brightness temperature at 37 gigahertz vertical polarization. This is brightness temperature at 18 gigahertz vertical polarization. 
and, uh, and as these two are uh, very similar for first year ice and they're very high, uh, this is at, at this end of the cloud of points from, from ice areas, we, we identify that this is the first year ice signature. And then at the other end of this cloud of points, we identify as a multi ice signature. It's not completely, I, I mean, it, it's not crucial to have these two points at the very end of the cloud of points. The main point is to have them along this line uh, because we're only going to use the line, not the actual location of these two points. And then the water signature, as I said, we identify that as the average signature of a lot of data points from areas where there's uh, no ice. Having now established this sort of triangle with the green line and the two gray lines here, uh, we can do a very simple geometric calculation, assume that we have a measurement here at point X. Uh, we can do a very simple uh, geometric calculation to figure out what ice concentration this corresponds to. Uh, by drawing a line from the point W, that's the open water point, that's no ice, uh, through the point X and up to the green line. Uh, and then just doing a ratio of the distance from this point to X uh, divided by the distance from this point to the ice line. The distance from this point to the ice line is with this mixture of ice types, uh, it shows us the span of uh, brightness temperatures that we uh, need to cover from zero to 100% ice. Uh, so calculating this ratio uh, of the distance from here to here divided by the distance from here to here gives us the actual concentration of the ice. Yeah, I know what it's doing. Right. So, so that, that was one example of such very simple algorithms. And um, in, in the ESAS Climate Change Initiative project uh, that I mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, we actually searched through the literature and found uh, up towards 30 different algorithms that uh, are of similar nature. Some of them are slightly more advanced than the one I showed you. Some uses more than two uh, channels of the radiometer. Uh, some uses uh, dual polarization and, uh, and so on. But, uh, but we did then an experiment where we compared the performance of these different algorithms uh, to try to identify the best one. Uh, and um, the, uh, the bar graph that you show uh, that, that you see on, on the right uh, on the uh, yeah on the right uh, it actually shows now sort of a listing of the performance of the different algorithms uh, there's a blue bar and a red bar for each algorithm and then there's actually a light blue one uh, that covers the blue and the red one uh, the light blue one is just the average of the red and blue so don't worry if you can't see the light blue one it's uh, uh, the other two uh, will give you the information that you need the blue bar shows the standard deviation of the retrieved ice concentration from areas where there is no ice. So obviously we would want that to be zero. Uh, and uh, so we did, we did for all the algorithms actually a reasonable bias correction. So they are all unbiased, uh, but, uh, but they still have standard deviation of around the zero ice concentration. Uh, and that's what you see with the blue bars. With the red bars, you see similarly the standard deviation of ice concentration at 100% ice. So that's where uh, everything is ice. Uh, and, uh, and it turns out, as we could kind of expect, that at the very right end of this uh, plot, you, you find the high frequency algorithms, the one that uses the 85 or, uh, or 89 gigahertz uh, radiometers they are the ones that are most strongly influenced by the atmosphere, uh, and especially then the blue bars, uh, they skyrocket because they are very, uh, that's the low concentrations, that's where the atmospheric humidity, the clouds and so on have the strongest influence. Uh, whereas on the very uh, uh, left side, uh, the, 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 you find the algorithms uh, that uses the low frequency, uh, so you see the, the, the last one is called V6 gigahertz, so that's six gigahertz vertical polarization, actually only the six gigahertz vertical polarized channel. Uh, so what this shows is that uh, you really want low frequency algorithms in order to get a high accuracy in your ice concentration and reduce the noise from the atmosphere. Not surprising because the influence of the atmosphere on the brightness temperature is much smaller on the low frequencies. Now then, why did I just show you an example of an algorithm that used 19 and 37 gigahertz? Well, because as we also saw yesterday, the spatial resolution at six gigahertz is rather poor with the current radiometers. Um, and, uh, and so we want to be able to have 
a reasonable spatial resolution. Actually, typically climate modelers or ice ocean modelers tells us that they want a resolution in the order of 10 kilometers. Uh, that cannot be done even using 18 and, uh, um, and 37 gigahertz, but requires including the uh, the near 90 gigahertz, as we call it, either 85 or 89 gigahertz. But you see the trouble that we run into when we use those uh, frequencies uh, to derive ice concentration. So in the end, uh, we had to select an algorithm or a combination of algorithms. Uh, and uh, realizing that the atmospheric influence was rather strong, we actually uh, decided to do not only one algorithm, but actually several uh, for different reasons. Um, and uh, so, so we ended up with producing a climate data set that contains these three different components. Um, the two top ones are similar. They are both produced on a 25 kilometer grid, but actually this one using, this is the one that spans the longest time period, 1979 to 2015. Um, and it, it uses, so it uses these old radiometers that had fairly small antennas, uh, and therefore the resolution of the product is actually not the 25 kilometers, but probably closer to 60 or 70 kilometers. We still produce a data set on 25 kilometer resolution to have it comparable to the data set that we can produce using the AMSR radiometers uh, that uh, from 2002 until uh, basically the present time. Actually, this time series is also being continued by UCSAF using their operational uh, data process which is very similar to the one that has been used to produce this climate data set. All these data sets are available uh, uh, and you can download them uh, either from the OCSAF or the ESA Climate Change Initiative uh, website. Uh, and uh, there's some links here uh, also to where you can download the data. But then we actually added a third um, data set uh, which is produced at 50 kilometer resolution and includes a six gigahertz uh, brightness temperature to actually take advantage of the fact that at six gigahertz, we get much less influence uh, by the atmosphere. So what are the steps involved uh, and what else did we do in order to um, produce such a climate data set? A climate data set that, as you can see, includes or uh, uh, the combination of measurements from many satellite radiometers. Um, and uh, it's actually even worse than what you saw in the previous figure. I just had them listed as SMMR, SSMI, uh, and AMSR. But actually, the SSMI is a series of uh, uh, almost 10 uh, radiometers over a period of uh, almost 30 years. Um, the AMSR uh, is two radiometers, AMSR E and AMSR 2. Um, and so on. So in order to actually be able to produce a data set that uses data from a number of different instruments, and some of these instruments uh, aging, as we just discussed uh, in the ocean color part here. Uh, so what can we do in terms of uh, making sure that the um, that our data set is consistent over such a long period of time using different instruments and using instruments that are aging. Uh, and so what? So one of the components that we added to our algorithm was, or actually two components that both play a, a, a role here. One is to dynamically adjust the tie points. So instead of using fixed tie points uh, for all the different instruments or even for each instrument, we actually on a daily basis update the tie points uh, so that, uh, and we identify these tie points from the data itself. Uh, that way we make sure that even drifts in the instruments, and also when we switch, it, switch from one instrument to another, uh, we get a consistent uh, time series of uh, brightness temperatures, and hence a consistent uh, time series of uh, ice concentrations. And then the other thing that we did was, um, due to the, the atmospheric influence, uh, that we wanted to reduce the atmospheric influence, so we investigated the, uh, the actual quantitative uh, influence of the atmospheric uh, components, uh, being the wind speed, the cloud liquid water, and the water vapor in the atmosphere. We used era interim uh, data for um, correcting the brightness temperatures to sort of an atmosphere-free set of brightness temperatures. Uh, this, of course, is already kind of, uh, I mean, you can argue that that's not necessarily a good idea to use data from one model to correct a data set that might eventually be used by other models. Uh, that's what we decided to do anyway. Uh, we could that way reduce the noise in the ice concentration data sets uh, quite substantially. But I will return uh, later uh, and discuss uh, in more detail uh, what, 
what, could, what we could have done instead or, or what other possibilities exist uh, in terms of taking into account this atmospheric variability. Let me just mention uh, that, uh, that there's also uh, uh, in Europe uh, two efforts right now for building microwave radiometers. I should say these are uh, US radiometers, these are Japanese radiometers, uh, but there is in Europe now, uh, the, the MWI for Meteosat second generation is being built, will be launched in 2022 or three, let's see. Uh, and, um, and there is also initiated uh, by the European Union uh, studies uh, going on, in, uh, conducted by ESA uh, for a Copernicus imaging microwave radiometer, uh, which is a multi-frequency, uh, which is also a multi-frequency microwave radiometer. The uh, the MWI for uh, for MEDOP second generation has a relatively small antenna, uh, so we are back to a relatively coarse resolution, uh, whereas the, uh, the Copernicus imaging microwave radiometer has a much larger antenna, uh, and uh, and will actually allow us to do ice concentrations, for example, or sea surface temperature for that matter, at a resolution which is much better than what we can do today. There's also a set of Chinese radiometers, and the Chinese radiometers might come in handy where if we run out of US or uh, Japanese radiometers before the time of the, uh, uh, of the launch of the European radiometers. So, uh, so there's a gap here that uh, might need to be filled, uh, and we are actually, we, we are already now uh, in the Umatsat Ocean and Sea Ice Application Facility using the, micro, the, the Chinese radiometers. Uh, they have small antennas as well, uh, so it's not, uh, it's not as the AMSR, but, uh, but it's similar to the SSMI. Right, one more thing about our algorithm. Uh, we did not just use an algorithm with two frequencies like you saw before. We actually uh, looked at and found that uh, using three, well, two frequencies, but using two polarizations for one of the frequencies. Uh, so here we have horizontal polarization at 37 gigahertz, vertical polarization at 19 gigahertz, and vertical polarization at 37 gigahertz. And you see, this is sort of supposed to be a, 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 a rendition of a three-dimensional uh, uh, pl scatter plot now, uh, but otherwise the principles are very much the same as, uh, as you saw before. Uh, this captures most of the variability, and there's much more detail in uh, a paper which is uh, right now um, in review, and it's, uh, you, can, you can find it on the Cryosphere discussion. Uh, it's already uh, available. You can download the discussion paper from there. Let me just, uh, so on the right side, you see uh, some of the validation uh, that we did uh, for the algorithms. Uh, and, uh, and there's three, again, three sets of curves um, in two columns. The left column, the left column of histograms is for low ice concentrations or open water. This is our validation for areas where there, should, where there is no ice. And the right set of, uh, the right column is a set of histograms showing the, uh, uh, the ice concentrations retrieved from areas where we believe that the ice concentration is very close to uh, 100%. Uh, and you see the numbers that, uh, that we get. Uh, you, you, well, first, and then the top row is the, uh, the, 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 the longest time series, the one that uses the coarsest resolution radiometer. Uh, the middle row is similar, uh, but uses the Japanese radiometers. And, uh, and then the bottom row is, again, the Japanese radiometers, but now including the 6 gigahertz channel. Uh, and you see that the histograms get narrower and narrower as we go down. Uh, and also, uh, there's a slight variation in the bias. Uh, but, uh, but the bias is, is, in general, very small due to this dynamic uh, method of identifying the tie points. Uh, and uh, so the bias is in the order of 0.5%. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, we believe, uh, sort of uh, manageable. Uh, that is for the, um, for the open water case, so at low concentrations. Biases might be slightly larger at the high concentration end, but they are also, we are not entirely sure that we found areas where we are sure that it's 100% ice everywhere. Uh, so part of the reason for that is, uh, could, could be related to the fact that the validation data set is not perfect. Uh, but you see, going from top to bottom in the, in the uh, rightmost column, uh, that uh, the histogram, especially the bottom one that includes the 6 gigahertz channel, has a much narrow histogram and, uh, and hence a much smaller noise in the retrieved ice concentration at high concentrations. Then remember, uh, as you've seen now several times over the last couple of days, uh, that uh, these 
measurements are all taken from polar orbiting satellites. Uh, this is just a couple of examples of daily coverage with the SSMIS and the SSMI uh, for the northern hemisphere, or most of the northern hemisphere. Uh, and it shows that um, at a very high latitude, we get almost complete coverage uh, during one day. Um, but, we, but that means also the fact that these are polar orbiting satellites, that the maps that you see of ice concentration covering the entire Arctic, they are not snapshots. They are actually composites of all the measurements uh, during one day. Um, you saw the right part of this uh, figure already uh, yesterday. It shows the different sizes of the, or, or the, yeah, of, of the footprints. Uh, so uh, the, the, the take home message here is that the 3 dB beam width of, the, of an antenna is approximately 1.2 time, times the wavelengths divided by the diameter of the antenna. And hence, the larger the antenna, the narrower the beam, uh, or uh, vice versa, the larger the wavelength, uh, the wider the beam. Uh, and this is sort of just uh, explains why we have this big difference in resolution between the high frequencies and the low frequencies. Uh, on the left side, uh, you see uh, the other side to resolution. That's the radiometric resolution. The radiometric resolution of a microwave radiometer is uh, proportional to the noise in the radiometer as well, plus the noise signal that we are trying to measure divided by the square root of the bandwidth and the integration time. And this becomes important because the smaller the footprint is, uh, the, uh, the, the, the shorter period we have to integrate before the footprint has moved sort of one diameter of a footprint. Uh, and that hence the integration time. So we actually get more noisy measurements the smaller the footprint we are, we, we are making. Um, we can compensate for that by having a wider bandwidth, uh, but the bands that we can use for this are limited because uh, we have radio frequency interference, and if we start using frequency bands that are also used for terrestrial services, for example, uh, then we end up actually getting contaminated signals uh, due to these uh, terrestrial radars or uh, cell phone systems or, or, or whatever. Uh, so there's limits to how wide uh, a band we can do. Another uh, figure that uh, compares the, um, the three different products uh, that I just mentioned, and actually a fourth one, and that's the upper left one. Uh, but the three that I just mentioned is um, in the bottom right, the, uh, the, the long uh, time series, the one uh, where we are producing it at 25 kilometers, but where the resolution is probably more like uh, 60 to 70 kilometers. And then on top of that, uh, the, uh, uh, the data set with the Japanese radiometers, where the resolution is closer to the actual 25 kilometers of the grid spacing. Uh, and then at the bottom left uh, is the, uh, the 50 kilometer data set that uses the low frequency radiometer. And then finally, there is also, uh, we did some experiments with the 12 and a half kilometer uh, product that combines the higher frequency uh, channels and our atmospheric correction of the brightness temperatures, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and what you clearly see is um, uh, an underline, when comparing these two, which are both produced on a 25 kilometer grid, uh, you see that grid spacing is not the same as resolution. This is something to always keep in mind when you use remote sensing measurements that don't look at the grid spacing to find out what the resolution is. Uh, you have to do your own assessment or look in the manual to see what the resolution really is. I mean, we could reproduce this at one kilometer grid spacing. That wouldn't make it a one kilometer resolution product. It would just be interpolated to one kilometer grid spacing. Uh, and often you actually find satellite data products that are interpolated to much finer grid spacing than the actual grid spacing uh, justified by the data products. Now, in order to be able to use data sets like this for um, assimilation into models, it's very important, or for validation of models, or for, for, or for climate monitoring, it's important to know also the uncertainties uh, in the data set. So again, uh, up here you see the actual ice concentration maps. This is for the Weddell Sea, so this is the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, you see the, the, the two 25 kilometer products, uh, again, similar issue uh, as we saw before, that here the resolution is not really 25 kilometers, whereas over here it's closer to 25 kilometers. Uh, and then we see for this product here, uh, our estimate of the uncertainties. And we estimate the uncertainties in the product uh, by two different components. Uh, this is the uncertainty 
due to the actual variability of the ice and ocean signature. Uh, and this is the uncertainty due to the gridding at 25 kilometers instead of the more uh, true uh, 70, 60 or 70 kilometers. Uh, and you see that, uh, of course, this, we call it smearing uncertainty, is very much enhanced along the, uh, where, where we have strong horizontal gradients in the ice concentration. So along the ice edge, and also in other areas where we have uh, strong gradients in the ice concentrations, we have a very strong impact. And then we, when we combine these two, you also realize that the smearing uncertainty in those areas is actually much larger than the uncertainty in the retrieved ice concentration. So it's really important to be careful about what grid resolution you use for a data set if you want to have, take the full advantage of the accuracy of the data set. And if you reproduce a data set at a much finer resolution, it actually deteriorates your data set uh, and, uh, and you have to be careful about that. Another couple of uh, features of the data sets that we already sort of touched upon uh, yesterday is the, um, what, what I here call the apparent concentration of thin ice. Uh, and this is not only for our data sets, this is for all data sets. This is a number of, of, of other, uh, of the more popular algorithms that are used to generate ice concentration. Uh, so what we did was to identify a number of points in the fall uh, in, in synthetic aperture radar images, these were actually from NVSAT. Uh, we identified areas, large areas of uh, very low backscatter ice uh, with no open water. Uh, and, uh, and then we used the SMOS thin ice thickness. So at L band, you can actually uh, measure the thickness of thin ice. Uh, and we now plotted now this SMOS thin ice thickness versus the apparent concentration. Remember the real concentration here, we believe is 100%. Uh, and all the algorithms that we tested, including our own ones, which is what you see over here, they have this drop in ice concentration uh, when the thickness of the ice gets below 20 to 30 centimeters. Uh, so this is an inherent property of the product. There's nothing really we can do about it. Well, we could, com we could correct for it if we knew the thickness, but we don't know the thickness, especially not the thickness uh, uh, amb ambiguously from the concentration. The other issue with our data set, as well as with uh, 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 all the others, basically, is melt ponds. Uh, I said yes, uh, yesterday that uh, melt ponds look like open water, and this is also what is confirmed uh, by all these plots. Uh, they show two things. They show on the x-axis the ice surface fraction, and on the y-axis for a number of different uh, standard algorithms, the ice concentration. And ice surface fraction is the fraction of the surface within the resolution cell, which is neither open water nor melt ponds. So we sort of extract or subtract the melt ponds and the open water, and then we believe that the rest is the ice at the surface. Uh, and, uh, and that should then show up as uh, with a linear relationship and the gray line here is the expected linear relationship. Now what we find also with all these algorithms and this goes for our own algorithm as well, is that in the summer there's actually two sort of counterbalancing effects. One is this overestimation, or one is the underestimation of the ice concentration due to the melt ponds, uh, but the other is an overestimation of the ice concentration due to the wet snow on the surface of the ice in between the melt ponds. Uh, and, uh, and those two uh, is the reason why we don't follow the gray line here, but we actually have a bias towards high concentrations when the melt pond fractions are very small, uh, so when the ice surface fraction is very large. Uh, so these were all other people's algorithms, and this is actually our algorithms. We managed to bring down this bias a little bit, but actually not much. We have similar problem uh, during the summer to most of the other algorithms that you find in the literature. So to summarize uh, with these sort of standard algorithms, um, melt ponds will be seen as open water and cannot be distinguished from real open water or open water, water with, uh, where there's no ice underneath. And, there's, and we cannot fix this consistently unless we bring in, bring in external melt pond fraction information, for example, from models. But if you're going to use our data set in your model, then you probably wouldn't like that we've taken melt pond fraction from somebody else's model and corrected our ice concentrations. Similarly with the thin ice, uh, that there's a systematic uh, underestimation of concentration of ice less than 20 centimeters, and even between 20 and 50 centimeters, there can also be a low bias in ice concentration. Again, we cannot fix this unless we bring in <coughs> ice thickness information from somewhere, and you might not like 
where we took the size thickness information. Uh, so actually what we suggest to do instead is to take our ice concentration with these properties and then use what we can supply, which is a relationship between sea ice concentration, sea ice thickness distribution, and melt pond fraction in your model to actually compute from your model what our product should tell you, or you can do it the other way around, but then you have everything consistent in your own model world and not in somebody else's model world. And this is what uh, Tom Alavern here from, uh, from the Norwegian Met Office has tried to, uh, tried to illustrate uh, that um, in order to uh, translate the state of your ice in a model to the state of the ice that we re retrieve by satellites, you need to correct, at least for the known errors in the ice concentrations. Uh, and what the one way of doing that is to take the ice concentration from your model, apply a correction which is due to the ice surface fraction, so which is due to the melt ponds, apply another correction that based on the thickness distribution in your model, and now you get something which is much more comparable with the satellite product uh, that we are providing. The unique thing about the satellite products that we are providing is that we actually give you this information. Most other products of sea ice concentration, they don't tell you how to do this, and, uh, and you're sort of lost. Uh, you can compare then this with this, which is really comparing apples and oranges. Okay, this was all the simple stuff. Now we go to slightly more complicated stuff. Um, and the more complicated stuff is instead of trying to do sort of ad hoc corrections and uh, empirical corrections. Um, we use what is called an observation operator. Well, I, you could kind of call this an observation operator as well. Uh, it takes the state of your model and translates it into a state which is what the satellite is actually measuring. But we can expand on this and, uh, and we can build a satellite simulator uh, which takes the ocean state, the sea ice state, the atmospheric uh, or, uh, and the fraction of the surface, which is ice, and the fraction which is melt ponds, and hence the fraction which is ocean or water, combines that into a combined surface emissivity model, then take our atmospheric knowledge uh, and, and do a radiative transfer in the atmosphere. We can apply footprint operators, so we can take into account that the footprints of the different brightness temperatures are not, at the, are not the same size by having antenna gain properties uh, and eventually actually compute brightness temperatures from our model state, uh, brightness temperatures that you would expect to be measuring if your model state was correct. And this now forward operator can be used in a data assimilation context uh, to assimilate brightness temperatures, the brightness temperatures measured by the satellite directly into your model. Uh, instead of letting somebody translate that into ice concentration, which you know is not correct, uh, and which may not be consistent with your model, uh, and then trying to invert that. So I guess um, th these were just some examples of slides that I threw in. You can have a look at them. They are uh, actually some slides to try to, to look at uh, what is in the red uh, uh, ellipse there, uh, the snow and ice emissivity model. This is where current research is going on. Uh, s simple snow and ice emissivity models and also some quite complicated ones actually uh, exist. Um, a, a recent one is this SMRT, uh, which is actually in a publication uh, that, uh, that I have listed uh, at the end uh, that just came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a community model in Python, and, uh, and you can download it, and you can play around with it. And uh, uh, there are uh, similarly uh, various versions of uh, ocean surface emissivity models uh, and atmospheric radiative transfer models. Uh, so all this uh, you can put together, uh, and, uh, and you can start start doing your own uh, satellite simulator. So these are the kind of components that needs to go into an ice uh, model. Uh, and actually, these are all the variables for ice and snow that goes in. So snow density, snow thickness, snow surface temperature, snow wetness profile, snow grain size. And for the ice, it's salinity of the ice, which is related to ice type, uh, as we've seen, ice thickness, ice density, and ice surface roughness. And all this allows you to calculate from a set of ice and snow variables, the brightness temperature of an ice surface allows to, compu uh, to calculate as, uh, sort of with some, uh, uh, some effort. Uh, you can do that. 
And, and the nice thing about this SMRT model that I just mentioned is that it has actually done all this. Uh, it's radiative transfer calculation like the one that we looked at uh, yesterday for the atmosphere, uh, but now a radiative transfer calculation that we're doing in the ice and snow instead. Um, so it's basically integrating from the bottom of the ice up through the ice and the snow up to zero, which here is defined as the top of the snow. Uh, and what you integrate is the absorption uh, coefficient uh, multiplied by the temperature, so the brightness temperature at each uh, uh, level in the ice, and then you multiply that by the attenuation of that by, from, from that level onto the, the, to, uh, the top of the snow. Um, the, the, the two circles there, the, uh, or, or ellipses, uh, indicate that uh, when we apply such calculations at high frequencies, uh, we need to take into account not only absorption, but also scattering. Uh, one of you asked yesterday about difference between infrared and microwave uh, radiative transfer uh, model calculations of upwelling and downwelling temperatures. And this, if you're doing infrared, radiative transfer calculation, uh, you need, you cannot neglect scattering, whereas at the low frequencies below like 30 gigahertz or uh, 40 gigahertz, we tend to neglect scattering in the atmosphere uh, at microwave wavelengths, but we cannot neglect scattering in snow and ice. Uh, uh, we have to include that as soon as the frequency is above 10 gigahertz. Uh, so, um, so, so scattering, the scattering contribution has to be included. But once we've established that, then I'm, and, and this is sort of the end of, uh, of the lecture today, uh, I'm just gonna show you an example of how to then apply such a model um, to retrieve now not only ice concentration, but actually, as we've learned, the microwave measurements are influenced by many different variables for the atmosphere, for the ocean surface, and from the ice. Um, so instead of sort of trying to either neglect some of those and just consider them as noise, uh, or trying to correct for them. Um, since the brightness temperatures in themselves uh, actually contain information about the ones that uh, we might want to neglect, um, and we have now a model that can tell us what the brightness temperature should be, uh, we can actually uh, invert the whole um, measurement equation. And this is basically our measurement equation. It says that the, now I call it TA for antenna temperature, um, but it's kind of, you can consider this to be equivalent with brightness temperature for now, um, is our linearized, the, model is non, the models are nonlinear, but, but, but what we do, and I'll return to that uh, at the bottom here, is we linearize the models, uh, so the antenna temperatures is our linearized model pl uh, multiplied by a vector of physical variables. So the M matrix here is what is called the Jacobian. It's basically the, the partial derivatives of the um, brightness temperatures with respect to the physical variables. The physical variables are the ones that are listed over here in the blue box uh, on the left. Uh, so they are the ones that I will be using in the example that I show you here. Um, because there's noise in our measurements, so the E is noise in our measurements, uh, noise in the TAs, but actually also noise or errors in the model M, um, we cannot just simply solve this matrix equation, uh, but we need to take into account the magnitude of this noise, and we do that by uh, the covariance, the error covariance, or the noise covariance, uh, you might say SE, which is the, uh, yeah, the error covariance, uh, not only of the radiometer sensitivity, uh, but actually also of, the, of, the, of, of, the, of our model, uh, brightness temperature model. M I mentioned already. Um, and then in addition to the microwave measurements, we also have some background information. This could be from climatology uh, or in a model context with, where this is exactly the way you would assimilate brightness temperatures into your model. In a model context, you would have a priori information from your model run through to the time step when the satellite measurements are carried out uh, that tells you what your model expects to be the ice concentration, the ice temperature, the sea surface temperature, the wind speed, and so on. Uh, especially if you have a coupled model, uh, you, will, you might know all of these if you have a, a, a fully coupled model. Uh, if you only have an ice mo ocean model, then the atmospheric ones you would have to uh, assume from somewhere else, and that could be climatology then. Now, because the, the, the model is nonlinear, uh, you need to iterate towards a solution, uh, and this is, uh, th this is the equation. Uh, and, and I actually threw in a slide here. I'm not going to go through the details, but just, 
showing you uh, how we get to this solution, basically. Uh, the very simple one at the top, I can mention, this is when there's no noise in the measurement and no noise in the, in the model, so in a perfect model context. Uh, so this is just a matrix equation, TA is a vector, P is a vector, M is a matrix. Uh, so multiplying by M transpose on both sides of the equation and then dividing by M transpose M uh, inverts the equation and now gives us P as a function of TA, and that's the uh, estimate of uh, the variables, uh, the physical variables that are in the P vector. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the next two uh, sets of uh, equations shows you how to do this when there's noise in the measurements and how to do it when, there's also, when we also have some a priori knowledge that we can use to constrain the solution. This is how to set that up in an operational environment, and we actually have this running operationally with the AMSO2 data every day at DTU. Uh, and uh, this is just an example uh, of uh, now a retrieval on one day uh, of uh, the seven different variables that, uh, that I have, uh, that, 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 we, that we're using uh, for this. So it's ice concentration, it's multi-ice fraction, it's ice uh, temperature, it's water vapor in the atmosphere, cloud liquid water in the atmosphere, wind speed on the ocean surface, and sea surface temperature. Uh, and you see how this combined retrieval actually produces uh, quite accurate ice concentrations, but it also gives us the other variables at the same time. Uh, so a combined retrieval uh, where we use information in all the brightness temperatures to actually kind of correct the ice concentrations, if that was our main target variables for the uh, atmospheric con uh, water content or the wind speed, uh, or adjust the brightness temperature of the ocean by the sea surface temperature that we can derive from the same microwave radiometer measurements. And not only do we get the retrieved variables, we actually also get the uncertainty in the retrieved variables. Uh, so if you noticed uh, here, uh, we had not only P, which is an estimate of the variables, but we also had S, which is the covariance, the error covariance of the retrieved variables. Uh, so we can now have a look at the, uh, the, the uh, diagonal elements of the S matrix. Uh, and this shows us uh, in the upper left for sea ice concentration, that sea ice concentration is reasonably accurate everywhere. We have blue colors. That's, uh, that's a good sign. That means that we have very high accuracy. Um, in our sea ice concentration, except in the few green patches. And the few green patches, if you look over here, they are associated with areas of very strong wind speed. Uh, if you look at the wind speed figure, which is the, the second from the, from the right uh, in, the, in the bottom row. Um, so, um, and, and, and then for multi-ice fraction and for ice, Temperature, obviously we find red colors in the ocean because there is no ice, so we cannot retrieve ice temperature. Uh, kind of similar for the atmospheric variables, we find more blue colors over the ocean and more greenish colors uh, over the ice. Uh, and that is because over the ice, uh, our uh, retrieval is much less accurate uh, because the ice has a much higher brightness temperature. So seeing the atmosphere on the cold brightness temperature background of the ocean gives us very good retrievals, whereas when we see the atmosphere over the very warm background, microwave background of the ice, we get rather poorer retrievals uh, of the atmospheric variables. And similarly, obviously for wind speed and sea surface temperature, it's the inverse situation than for the ice variables that we can only retrieve wind speed and sea surface temperature where we have uh, open ocean. Uh, so, so those have uh, high values in the uncertainty over the ice. Basically over the ice, they are constrained only by this climatology. So in this, we use climatology. We didn't use a model. We just use climatology as our background state, uh, our a priori uh, information. Good. Finally, doing this, we you can also have a look at the discrepancy between at your solution, the, the, the brightness temperatures that your model produces, your forward model produces, and the brightness temperatures measured by the satellite. Ideally, you would want them to, to be the same. Uh, then that means you've got a perfect match. Uh, but you see that there are actually some areas where that is not the case. Uh, in, in particular, there's some large areas uh, in, the, in the center of the Arctic Ocean uh, where obviously this sim simple distinction of having only first year ice and multi ice, which we also applied in this case, uh, does not hold. Uh, there's some ice there that has a different signature uh, from a linear combination of the multi ice and first year ice signature. And then you also see along the ice boundary, um, you see, for example, uh, down here, 
uh, in, uh, in Davis Strait uh, and into the Labrador Sea, you also see an enhanced uh, um, discrepancy between the observed brightness temperatures and the measured brightness te uh, and the model brightness temperatures. And this is due to the fact that in these areas, uh, we are in all areas, but in these areas, this plays a role. Uh, we are using a data set where the different brightness temperatures are at different resolutions uh, according to the footprint of the antenna. We could have used, a, and, and there is actually, we are doing some, we have been doing experiments also with a data set where everything is at a resolution, at the resolution of the 60 uh, kilometers of the six gigahertz channels, uh, but we didn't do that here, and uh, so that's another sort of caveat. Right, so to conclude, satellite data products level two, level three, level four, are not the truth. Satellite measurements, on the other hand, the raw satellite measurements are normally pretty accurate. Engineers, clever engineers in, uh, in ESA and European industry, they've spent a lot of time uh, working on uh, making very accurate measurements of brightness temperatures, not of ice concentration uh, or other uh, physical variables. So these electromagnetic radiation measurements are very accurate. Uh, but they are not measurements of sea ice concentration or sea surface temperature or wind speed uh, or whatever. And, uh, and so um, this is something to take into account when you use these products. Do you really want to use derived variables that somebody has produced for you? Or would you actually rather go the step to using a, what I call a satellite simulator here or forward model or operate, uh, uh, observation operator and assimilate the brightness temperatures into your, uh, into your model? There's still a lot of useful information in the level two to level four products. So, uh, so it's not that it, they're useless. It's just that you have to use them with these caveats. This is just the example of sea ice concentration, but there are other examples uh, that uh, for, I mean, the, 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 the other important sea ice variable is, um, is sea ice thickness. Sea ice thickness is measured by altimeters, either laser or radar altimeters, in order to translate the freeboard that you measure by the alt uh, altimeter into a sea ice thickness, you have to make assumptions about snow cover. This, these assumptions that you make about the snow cover, often they are climatolo climatological snow cover. You might not like that if you want to assimilate the measurement into your model. You might want to actually use what we could call the radar freeboard. So the actual freeboard measured by the, laser, the radar or the, or the laser freeboard, and then use your own snow cover from your own model, which you probably trust better than somebody else's snow cover, uh, especially snow cover climatology, uh, to actually make more use of the satellite data products. This is just something that you can have a look at uh, later on. This is an, uh, these are a number of links to data sets that I've used or mentioned uh, in the presentation here, and uh, a couple of uh, uh, links also to uh, papers, uh, the, 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 the top one being the one that describes our algorithm and the validation of our algorithm. Uh, the middle one is the one that compares, uh, that describes this intercomparison of, of the 30 different uh, microwave radiometer sea ice concentration algorithms. And the bottom one is the, the, the very recent one from just a couple of weeks ago uh, describing this SMRT uh, uh, community uh, snow radiative transfer model. And then finally, a bit of advertisement. Um, I've been involved in organizing a series of workshops uh, under the International Ice Charting Working Group on uh, sea ice observation, sea ice modeling, and sea ice data assimilation, and in recent years also verification of sea ice modeling. And, uh, and out of that, those series of workshops, uh, this book came out last year, uh, and uh, it actually has chapters on exactly these topics uh, on sea ice physics, uh, sea ice observations, mostly remote sensing observations, but actually also in situ observations, um, and on uh, sea ice modeling, data assimilation and verification, uh, and some sort of future prospects. So uh, uh, if you're interested in sea ice and sea ice modeling and the use of sea ice data in models, uh, I can uh, certainly recommend this uh, book as some uh, place to find much more information than what I've been able to give you here uh, in two one-hour lectures. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Doodle. Are there any questions? Yep. Does, your, uh, does the snow, emissivity, snow and ice emissivity model account for pollution or aerosol effects at all? Or is it even an issue? It, 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 might, it can be an issue. Um, I 
don't think, I, this is not my model, this is a model that is developed uh, basically by uh, researchers, mainly in France, but also with some contributions from, uh, from, from other people. Uh, and, uh, and so I don't know the, the, the details, I don't think it, uh, it accounts for pollution, except if you can uh, assume pollution can be described by similar properties than as the ice and snow properties. Uh, so by uh, uh, basically grain sizes and correlation length and, uh, and, and absorption uh, coefficients and so on. It was originally developed for snow on land uh, and, uh, and then has, as part of this effort, it's being extended to also uh, do snow on sea ice uh, with the different t ice types underneath, uh, or actually ice with different properties, uh, uh, different densities and salinities and so on.